you guys are uh, um, eating, please feel free to have all you want. There's plenty. We made sure there was plenty. Um, let me just start by <clears throat> saying this week what I meant to start off with last week, and we just kind of dove in. Um, thank you for what you do. Uh, we really appreciate the work that all of you guys put in to making our small group ministry what it um, what it is. Um, we know it requires a lot of uh, time, a lot of attention, and a lot of times it goes seemingly unnoticed. I just want you to know that it is not unnoticed. Um, so thank you. We really do appreciate that. Um, we update a few things from last week. Um, we talked kind of about the status of, of everything. We looked at some percentages. We kind of went back through Breeze, also took some of your input with who's coming, uh, what are actually the groups are. Uh, we, we have 13 groups that are active, um, and of the 16 that we started with, two of them have disbanded completely. There's one that is still on the list, but I don't think they meet uh, with much regularity. It's kind of dwindled down. Uh, so 13 groups of the original 16, I think, is, is really good. Um, there are 35% of our families. We kind of went off of the family unit as opposed to just trying to do individuals because as we looked we have uh, adults listed on the roll but we don't have children and children are listed as individuals on breeze so with that kind of update we have 35 percent of our family units that are enrolled and of those 35 percent really only five percent are on the roll but not active so i think i think that's really good i think that's a really positive place to begin with i think that is a really solid foundation that we can begin to build on and for me, the most impressive aspect of it is the consistently active nature of, of that 30%. Um, it is constant. And that's not something that we find all the time when we go into looking at small group ministries. Uh, so just uh, as we kind of move through, we're going to talk about a, a few little things. Hopefully I can get some of your input, some of your questions, some of your comments, maybe some of your concerns talk about some things that uh, are going well and some ways that we can be uh, supportive for you. I'll give you some things that I plan on doing. I hope we'll add to the resources that we have, um, but also want to get your input on what kind of needs that we may have going forward. Um, <clears throat> to, to correct kind of where we were going last, uh, last week, sermon-based small groups is the standard that we're going to have. Um, I know that there's a couple of groups that do some things a little differently, and those groups are, are doing really well. Um, if it's not broke, we don't want to try to fix it. So if what you're doing is working and it's not that, you know, keep at it. Um, if it gets to a point where you're kind of really not sure where or what to go, then you can always pick this up on a, uh, on a, on a couple of week basis while those things are getting ironed out. Um, but, you know, we don't, we don't want to try to shake things up if things are going well. So I know Steve's group, you know, right now they've been going through The Chosen. They really like that group. It gets a lot of conversation out of it. And um, if that's working for your folks and they really like it and they're engaging, then, you know, let's keep at it. And I know Virginia's group does uh, some individual Bible study. They're consistent. They're engaged and engaging. Um, so just, just continue to let us know if, if that is a little bit different path that you're on so that as we're getting ready to bring new folks in, we know who it is that we're asking them to engage with, kind of what's going on in those groups, but also just kind of helps us stay together. So, um, the, the reason sermon-based small groups are our um, standard is experience and research has shown that really these kind of groups are self-sustaining. They just continue. There is a constant flow of information because, as you guys know, every Sunday we have a sermon. Um, I don't know, Jody. Have you ever stood up? Sometimes a couple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you ever stood up one and, and said, you know what, guys, we uh, no sermon this week. You know what, we're just out. We're done. Um, I don't have anything to say. Or you know what, life was just busy, so I didn't prepare anything for you. So. Uh, you get out of service 30 minutes early today. That just doesn't happen. 
And if it did happen, you might get away with it once, but you probably not get away with it more than that. So it's a constant flow of information. It is self-sustaining. There are a lot of churches that go into small group settings and they'll use some, some different models. And you see them all out there. They come from all different kinds of <clears throat> programs and experts and gurus. And what almost inevitably happens is they begin. There's a massive surge in um, attendance and popularity. But as soon as the newness wears off, it begins to fade. And what you'll see in those programs is there is a constant relaunch 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 because it's just not sustainable because it relies on the momentum of the new it's just hard to continue to come up with so sermon based small groups are self-sustaining um, and while sometimes it's like man is that all it is on the surface it looks a little simple when you really get involved with it what you find is there are so many things that transpire that bring value as we are taking the word of God that's being preached and drilling it deeper and deeper and deeper into our lives. So many good things that come from that. So, um, if you find yourself in a little bit of a lull where you're really not sure what to do, or you're really not sure why the momentum is trying, kind of stopping, um, maybe, uh, maybe you take a few weeks and really kind of reassess that. If you're doing something different, to come back into just processing the sermon. And that's what we're going to do as a, as a standard for our groups. Um, selling the name. Jody, this morning even, said small group training. You know, um, is anyone say, I want, I want it to be called Connect Groups? I don't have an opinion one way or the other. That, that's my third option, okay? I haven't given that option yet. Second option is, does anyone say, I want it to be called small groups? That's and who doesn't care? That's what we're comfortable with. Yeah. Oh, I, I hear you. All right. So um, forget about my background. It is going to be the Pine Tree Small Group Ministry. Okay? Um, and my background will be changed, not on the YouTube, because I'm not that um, technically adept. But uh, we're just going to call them the Pine Tree Small Groups. So I think, I, personally, I think it's simple. I think it's recognizable. If someone from the outside comes in and they see a sign that says Pine Tree Small Groups, there is no doubt what they're getting when they sign up for a Pine Tree Small Group. Um, we can talk later about whether we're going to call them Bible classes or Bible communities. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, you know, but we're, we're going to pick one thing at a time and kind of get, get on page with, uh, with lingo there. So, all in favor, aye. aye. Any opposed? Hey. Satisfied everyone in the room. Another miracle, right? Um, and the third thing we need to address is just this. Um, we need new leaders. Um, Asking for volunteers is not the way to get leaders either. So uh, maybe you know somebody, maybe there's someone in your group that has kind of taken on a little bit of a leadership role. Um, maybe as uh, shepherds and ministers, maybe we just go <clears throat> tap people on the shoulder and say, hey, uh, we need you. Um, what I don't want is, a, I don't want someone just feeling almost guilted into a role or you know well nobody else is volunteering I guess I will um, you know I, I think it's good to appoint people that we see that opportunity in or that uh, there's another word not opportunity but not possibility potential see that potential in um, <clears throat> we have a lot of new families that have come in over the last six eight months or a year uh, we'll, and we need to begin to have a place for them to come in. Maybe a, uh, maybe a new member group is a, is a good one to have. So someone that's good with reaching out to new folks, they have that in common. Um, it gives them an opportunity to connect to someone that's in the body. Uh, we talked about doing a college age kind of a small group ministry. Uh, we've got some people in mind for that. I know Clint and Sarah had offered some of their uh, resources. So. We have a lot of, of opportunities there. We just need to be aware that that is a need that we have. If we're going to continue to expand, and I think if we we're going to be intentional about our small groups, it, it will um, naturally begin to expand and grow. Because as people step in and see what's going on, 
they're going to immediately see the value. Uh, and I think that becomes contagious. I think it becomes very, very obvious when something like that's going on. And it just changes the atmosphere and the environment when those things begin to transpire. So we need to prepare for that. And so we need to be talking to people about being small group leaders and just encourage them, hey, just come on in. Maybe we're going to come in and, and co-lead with, with one of the current leaders for, for a few months and, and kind of see that it's really not that overwhelming of a task. Um, and it really is going to be good for the mission of the church here. Um, <clears throat> Ideally, uh, this is just, look, most people have Sundays already set aside. Uh, so if you're thinking about a time and thinking about a date uh, with, uh, especially if you're talking about families with kids, the week, just the culture we're living in, the week gets busy. Um, Sundays, generally speaking, are, are already pretty well devoted. And so Sunday afternoon or after eat or after evening, Sunday afternoon or evening um, is, is probably going to be the best time uh, to at least begin there. And then as your group maybe has some needs, we may adjust that as uh, as you see fit. But uh, ideally, that's kind of what we're looking at, and it gives us a chance to stay um, on task. Uh, an idea of just a quick agenda. And again, if you have something that works for you, use it. Um, if you have kind of one of those groups that's, man, it's almost really good, but not something kind of missing this is kind of an ideal agenda of the kind of groups that we're in um a social moment of just social kind of people coming in uh, how many of you guys eat with your small group how many of you don't eat with your small group yeah ours, uh, is, ours is very very sporadic okay it's less on occasion on occasion a couple of three times a year maybe um, the, the research says if someone has something in their hand, they're going to be more likely to be social. Um, it doesn't have to be food. It can be a little snack. You can have, uh, you know, water, tea, and lemonade. Um, but somehow if they're, if they're carrying something, it just opens up points of contact naturally. Um, it's just, it's just the way we're wired. It's the way we're built in our culture. Um, so maybe it's just that chance of getting to know one another, talking about the week, 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I go backwards there, I did. Um, I would encourage you go 10 to 15 minutes of prayer sharing. Um, I, don't, I don't think that necessarily means that we pray right away. Um, I think there's something about people sharing prayer needs and then letting those prayer needs sit for a little while as we explore the things that we're talking about in scripture um, because then once that's over then you either put somebody on the spot initially or you're going to put them on the spot then to pray and then it just becomes a, a regurgitation of prayer requests um, but if you give someone the opportunity to kind of sit in those for a little while and really think about that it it provides for a, for a just a deeper avenue of prayer in that way um, and then bible study for 30 minutes anyone have any questions about how to study the bible for 30 minutes Okay, um, I'm going to talk to Jody, um, and I can send you guys a PowerPoint too, and you can have it all if you want. I can send you any information you need. Oh, there's Jody. He moved. You were right here. Now you're back there. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, the <laughs> this is the guy that was in the uh, not what I asked for, uh, but that's what we got, and we're gonna get something different next week. I would like for you to get that sheet because I want all of you as leaders to have that information. Um, I'm going to get it with Jody and I'm gonna, we're going to try to kind of whittle down what our folks have. I don't want their minds going all sorts of places during the sermon. I want to give them two or three things to really think about to come prepare to your groups to, to explore. Um, and uh, anyway, we're going to study the Bible for 30 minutes and hopefully they're going to come ready to talk about those things because of having access to that uh, study. And then at the end, I think it's a good time to come back together and say, okay, we've, we had some prayer sharing at the beginning. We've talked about the Bible and, and the study. And, you know, maybe that's given some people an opportunity to think about, you know, something else that's come up. Maybe that study has stirred something else in their heart. We need to add anything to the prayer. And then, you know, we spend 10 or 15 minutes in 
um, prayer as a group, individually. And there's all sorts of prayer exercises that you can use. Popcorn prayers, chain prayers, um, and just someone standing up and praying over what's there. So I do encourage you to be a little creative. Uh, this, is a, this is a good time to, um, to, to use the creativity in your group, uh, to really create a bond. Um, you're going to find as these groups begin to develop, those bonds get much deeper. Um, and this is a lot of time where you get some of your deepest and most impactful sharing. Um, oh yeah, and you can split up in groups. Just look. You can Google. I'll send you a link um, or a sheet that has some prayer exercises. Um, I think do, praying differently <coughs> changes our perspective of prayer. Um, I mean, it really does. And I'll send all you guys a, a sheet that has help. But I started reading it, and I'm, someone said, "Oh, there's like 30 different ways you can pray." I'm like, "Really?" And I start reading, I'm like, "Oh, that's." Oh, that's cool. Like, oh, that's neat. Like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. So, um, first time I did something that was like, it was really uncomfortable. And I kind of felt really corny. Um, but the more I did it, it was like, this is, this is really good. And it really changes my own outlook and my own perspective. So, um, <clears throat> these are my goals. I haven't run these by anybody. These don't come from our shepherds, although I don't think they would have any issue with it. There's might be a little higher. Um, my goal is 70% involvement of the church. And I say 70% uh, because the most successful churches and small groups out there are usually running 80 to 85% of their church involvement. But those churches that get that are doing two things every week. They're doing Sunday morning service and small groups. You'll not find any other activity. Um, <clears throat> in fact, a lot of them will start other ministries. But they will ask the question that says, how does this ministry affect our small groups? And if it affects them negatively, they will actually hamstring other ministries in their churches because mm. they don't want to affect their small groups. Um, I'm not about that. we got too many good things going on here. Um, there are too many active and, and effective ministries. Uh, but I do think that once people see the value of coming together as a small group, I don't think 70% is, is that far out of reach. We also live in a different culture of the church. Just, I mean, folks in the Church of Christ expect to be involved in the church. I mean, I think that's just naturally a part of our DNA uh, that we need to embrace um, and continue to encourage. So uh, 75% of the church as a whole, um, and I, and I want to see, uh, I want to see leaders being developed in our groups. Um, as, as the years go on, I want to see folks coming up and saying, you know what, this has been a great ministry for me. I want to go be a part of making this even better. And seeing our groups become as much about building relationships as they are about developing new leaders that are going to go out um, and continue to uh, advance that. Um, consistent training. Uh, that's a personal goal of mine. Um, my uh, objective is so last week and this week we're going to start a, a playlist on the church's youtube channel and the first two will be uh training 101 and training 102 kind of a thing uh, but after that about once a month i'm going to put a video on there that's going to be 10 minutes or less uh, that just simply gives you a tool how do you handle but we'll talk about the objectives in here and or the subjects here in a little bit but 10 minutes that just give you a resource on how to handle something in your group um, ideas maybe they've arisen because of some issues that you've raised maybe because of research that I've done uh, but just a constant list of things that you can go to when you when you're having something going on in your group you've got a resource um, and I mean 10 minutes a month that's not you know it's not a high demand on your time but it still is providing uh, value and I want that to be a consistent presence in in these groups as well as a, a diverse selection of groups. Right now, they're kind of, um, they're hard to identify right now. Say, hey, who's your group make up? It's like, like well, I'm not really sure. Whoever just had to come, and that's kind of what you get when they sign up. But um, I, I want to have some groups that are age specific. I want to have some groups that are um, point of life specific. Um, I also want to have some groups that are intergenerational. 
and in groups that are just kind of maybe random, but just a diverse selection. Maybe they're geographical, but you know, all of those different kinds of groups, I want to have those for people to choose from because everyone's going to have a different need and a different desire and we want to be able to offer that to them. So that's uh, my goal. I should probably look at what's coming next. It would probably help my thought a lot. Um, any thoughts here before we go on to challenges or obstacles? What are challenges you face in your small groups? Um, so we have, uh, I have some options for two or three new groups. Um, what I would like is I would like for the current groups that have space to just take two or three names and I'm gonna give all the leaders a, a list of names that are not involved in the small group ministry um, and just reach out to them uh, if for no other reason than to, to have a point of contact. Um, and then from that, I, I hope we can get some leaders to begin to expand in, into more groups. Uh, the groups that we have are pretty good size. Um, you know, the Bowers group could use a few more, but you can only use as much as you have living room space. So um, I know uh, Ben's group, if everyone shows up, is pretty full, but how often does everyone show up? Um, Gene, you've got quite a few, but you got a lot of space, right? you got a, quite a few ladies now there. I've, now that I've moved to the yeah. auditorium, yeah, I've got a you can, So we can get 450 people to Gene. And, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's senior time, you get fun. That, that's right, you do get sometimes. But the thing is, even, even in that group, in that space, you can still get too large, and we're, it becomes harder to share. So We're getting kind of kind of close to, to what that optimum number would be, mm -hmm. I think. And what I don't want, um, you know, initially we kind of had this idea that, well, you can grow and then you can divide. And the problem with that is if you divide those groups, you're going to lose two groups because nobody's really going to be happy most of the time. Where they're going to kind of, kind of whittle away because... <laughs> Logically, it makes sense, right? I mean, you can grow and divide, and that division kind of makes that even more. But the whole core of small groups is we're building relationships. And you don't want to build relationships and then sever them and, and, and move them on and move on. So, you know, that's, it's challenging. But what we do need to do is we need to provide avenues for growth, growth on the outside. So there are a few that are going to have room to kind of reach out and expand. Uh, but what I really hope is that some of you in your group have someone who is willing to step out and be a leader of a new group. And so I think that's where our growth from within our groups is going to come from. It's from people who are connected to that ministry who are going to be willing to take that step outside and say, um, I'll take this on, but we're going to have to tap them on the shoulder and, and ask them to do that. Um, but our 13 current groups really aren't going to change much, except for I am going to ask them to reach out a little bit more to just at least make contact with people to see if they're interested in joining a group, seeing what it's like, and then finding a place where they fit. So yeah. Really, how many groups do you want to add to the 13? 13? I mean, ideally, I would add as many groups as it takes to get 500 people involved. Um, I think, uh, realistically, I think, I think two or three groups a year, um, unless something radically unique transpires. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's going to be hard to manage too much more than that. Um, like I said, unless you have people, you're going to naturally have some groups that come up. Um, I think our college age group is a naturally forming group. If we can get that going, that would be pretty easy to sustain and maintain. Um, a new members group might be something that we look at over the next few months. Um, and that new members group might become a really core group that we add a new members group maybe once a year and just find someone to lead it. Um, so I would think between two and five groups a year, especially for the first couple of years, is going to be, you know, that's about as big a challenge as I want to take on. Do you have something, Zach? No? Yeah, be careful. It's like an auctioneer, man. <laughs> Start moving, moving hands or something. I'm going to call it. Um, so that's going to be the encouragement is you know our our teens are involved in teen activities two evenings a week or two evenings a summer 
a month. Damn. I do, I do know how to speak, I promise. Um, but uh, the encouragement we talked a little bit about last week and we'll have coming up is um, if you have parents that have teenagers, rich 56 kids, um, encourage them to bring those kids to small groups. It is so important. Um, like we said, I, I think small groups is the best children and family ministry we can have. Because if our children grow up seeing that as a, uh, um, as a priority, um, they're going to want to duplicate that, and they need to see that there are abilities or opportunities to build those relationships, you know, outside of what goes on in the hub and, you know, youth trips. So uh, we really encourage you as leaders to encourage their participation and give them that avenue to do so. Yeah, but no, and I think that's awesome. And, and, you know, any kind of value you can give them like that, even just being there and present in that moment just demonstrates the priority that we have. Um, you know, whether they sit through everything or not, just being present with everybody. I mean, it's so tempting to just say, well, you guys are old enough, just stay home, we'll be back in a couple hours. Um, but encourage that participation. Even if they come in for the prayer and they come in and they talk and then they have a prayer and then they go outside for, the, for some of the other things, I think the presence is just so valuable because they get to participate in the prioritization of being around God's people. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll give you some obstacles that will likely come up, okay? Um, these are some things you're going to face when you ask somebody to be in your small group, but I just don't have time. Um, the time demand. It's not that much, but it's an excuse that we use. Um, prioritization. Um, this is one of the issues that we're going to face. Uh, it, it's the same thing with we found it coming out of COVID, right? And then we can set time limits on comments from the beginning and just make that a, you know, a group-wide thing. That hey, in order in order to keep honor in order to honor everyone's time, let's keep our comments to you know a minute each, um, and just kind of set that as a standard for the group. If that doesn't transpire, you may have to deal with something in a little more personal way. We may have to have coffee or or lunch with somebody to sit down and say. And there's some things that I, I really appreciate the things that you have to say and the input that you have there's a lot of people in our group and we really want to allow everyone the opportunity to share and one person dominates that conversation that makes it really challenging so there are ways to have that conversation that both honors the relationship honors the person honors the desire but also sets an expectation for uh, kind of what is to come in, in the future uh, so dominating personalities uh, what do we do if our engagement's weak? Um, if we just can't get people to talk. Sometimes that's a challenge. Um, you want a good idea? Talk to Ben Fair. Ben Fair has some of the best icebreakers around. Mm -hmm. um, one of the most ridiculous things I ever did in youth ministry was icebreakers. I talked to this man right here, Aaron Parlow. We would go to camp and he would have the goofiest <laughs> icebreakers in the world. I was like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. But you know what it did? people came out of their shells because they're talking about the silliest things that don't matter at all. For instance, double stuffed or regular stuffed Oreos? Regular. regular. Why regular? You know, just go around the room and ask them and, you know, do you dunk your cookie, do you dunk your Oreos in milk or not? Do you twist them apart and eat the filling separately? Or do you eat one side? You know, they, they, they have nothing to do with the conversation we're going to have. But what they do is they start breaking down walls. Um, and so there are ways that we can, if our engagement is weak, it might not be about what's actually going on in the moment. It might be the way that we can kind of set some things up for success. Um, <laughs> what do you do when someone gives you some seriously sketchy answers to a question? Um, we were talking about heaven one day, and, and Jackson Dupree says, oh, it's going to be kind of like we're all zombies. And I'm like, no. Well, yeah, sorta. But let's let's flesh that out a little bit, you know. And, um, and sometimes you get some answers to questions, or you get comments that lead you in some really weird places. Um, and sometimes they're just flat wrong. How do we handle those? How do we deal with those? Um, how do we recognize when people in our group are in crisis? Mm -hmm. More importantly, what do we do when we make that recognition? Um, 
How do we handle that? Uh, what if someone admits to some great sin in a prayer request? Um, if our groups are functioning the way we have set them up to function, these are things that are going to transpire. Um, and so how we handle those things are really critical to, to next steps. How do we, what do we do with people that like to come in, but they always kind of want to sit on the edge, don't really always want to be involved, those fringe people, how do we bring them in and really make them feel at home and welcome? How do we handle, I got 17 families signed up or 17 people signed up in my group, but we have three people every week. Um, what are some things that we can do uh, to really encourage people to attend? Um, maybe as a group, you're kind of asking yourself, maybe it's me. What a, you know, I don't really feel like I'm the person that can lead this group. Um, and so what do we do with those moments of insecurity? So those are kind of the ideas of some of the things that I, I want to begin to give you tools to, to, to address.